This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Hello and welcome to The Late Show with James Robin on Teachers Talk Radio. Tonight, I'm joined by my guest, Carl McGrath, known as Mr. MICT on Twitter, as we discuss the importance and power of task design in the classroom. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Hello and welcome to what is a sunny 1st of September 2023 and welcome to the late show with me your host James Rubin on Teachers Talk Radio. Tonight we're going to dive deep into the captating realm of task design, a topic that forms the very bedrock of effective education. Now task design, the art of creating purposeful and engaging learning activity, lies at the heart of our exploration tonight and joining us to unravel The intricacies of this concept is none other than Carl McGrath, known in the education community as Mr. MICT on Twitter. Now, Carl is a remarkable curriculum design lead. He's an adept school primary educator and a member of the Digital Schoolhouse Initiative. He's a respected facilitator for the National Centre of Computing Education as well. So I'm really looking forward to this exploration and this discussion that we are going to have. So hopefully with this wealth of expertise and the conversations that we both have, we'll uncover the nuances of craft and tasks that align seamlessly with your instructional intentions, you're igniting that learner motivation, you're commanding intention, but you're uh, stimulating that cognitive growth. Now, as part of the Teachers Talk Radio Network, our goal is to provide educators with valuable insights and resources to enhance your teaching practices. And today's episode is no exception. We're going to equip you with some actionable knowledge, some questions, some thoughts that hopefully will transform your approach to creating meaningful learning experiences. So get ready to tap into the idea of task design, myself and Carl McGrath. So whether you're a teacher, a curriculum enthusiast, or simply passionate about the art of teaching, this episode promises to expand your horizons and fuel your pedagogical endeavours. Welcome, Carl. How are you doing this evening? I am good. Very good. Brilliant. Thank you for coming on tonight. Now, when I start doing these conversations, I always want to find out about the person behind who, who we're talking to. So kind of want you to introduce yourself to our audience and then go through your journey of education to the role you're in now, because it's a very interesting title you've got that I haven't <laughs> seen anyone else have. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, so I mean, my journey in education was quite a long one i suppose it wasn't straightforward but i suppose not many people's is um so i'd always wanted to be a teacher um initially i'd wanted to be a secondary history teacher uh but then i think no no disrespect to secondary colleagues um i was put off with the idea of teaching children and at the time obviously i was only a few years older than them um well a few years older than the oldest secondary school child so um it was my wife actually so she's a dance teacher and she's been teaching dance and choreography across newcastle and she was working in one particular primary school it's very famous in newcastle for its sort of representation of the arts um and having that in in terms of bedrock of its curriculum so she was in one day a week delivering dance across the school um from reception to year six and she basically um sort of asked quite nicely if I would be allowed to volunteer to see if teaching is definitely something I'd be interested in Um, and from there another quite interesting role came up it was um, I think I'm trying to remember the title now it was the learning and equalities mentor so um, I worked under uh, the learning equalities champion and I suppose it was a mix of different roles so within it it was a pastoral responsibility so looking after children who were from vulnerable backgrounds, pupil premium, free school meals, um, sort of breakfast club, break, lunch time, and sort of after school activities, and just being involved in that sort of 
holistic approach to safeguarding. Um, and obviously, as things happened, funding dried up, so my role became more expensive. So it was the head teacher that said I should probably look into teacher training. Um, and that's where I ended up. Obviously, I did a PGCE. Very first placement probably wasn't as successful as I'd hoped. Um, and it's definitely one of those things where the school doesn't fit. And it's that idea of you think every school's the same and then you suddenly get thrown into a completely different school and you realize they're not all the same. Um, then from there, my second placement, I ended up in a brilliant school. Obviously, whether you agree with the offset written or not, obviously it was deemed outstanding. But in terms of its reputation in Newcastle, obviously it was a very good one. And from there, obviously the opportunities just continued to open. Um, I became the computing lead, um, developed the curriculum, started working with uh, CAS Computing at Schools, obviously the National Centre for Computing Education, um, and sort of embedded myself within loads of computing fields or just sort of the computing community. Um, and I've always sort of looked at leadership. I've always loved the idea of designing things or really thinking about why we do certain things in the classroom or why children are given this task or why we should use this. And obviously in each school I've been in, we've always used iPads and devices. So again, very passionate about the how that can be used sort of in the learning uh, process. Um, and then within my school to cut a long story short there was a couple of internal positions for assistant head sort of key stage lead when one head teacher moved on the new one came in and it caused a lot of sort of reflection i think um is it assistant headship i want do i not want assistant headship and then this role came up um obviously still a classroom teacher role but this time with the tlr and obviously leadership responsibility and it would be working within the established curriculum team um, sort of alongside the head teacher, the deputy, the curriculum team and the assistant head and that idea of curriculum task design. And it's, obviously, it's interesting you say that sort of it's a title that's interesting. And I think even applying for the job, there was that sort of like, what is this job actually going to be about? And obviously there was a bit more into it once I got into the interview and obviously um, did the sort of classroom teaching element of it and conversations with the uh, interview panel and sort of my interpretation of the role clearly fit their expectations since it was successful to get the job um but really my understanding of it now is because obviously Ofsted shifted their framework and obviously really encouraged schools to develop their curriculum really think about their curriculum which i believe is was the right thing to do i think rightly so curriculum needed to really be focused on but then the sort of curriculum task design need sort of came out of that idea of well what happens next um you know you've developed your curriculum you've created tons of wonderful knowledge maps roadmaps um but what does it look like in the classroom what are the children doing how does the task reflect the curriculum you know you've had a thought and how does it get sort of digested down in front of the child or in their mind. So that's kind of where we are now. Excellent. What a fantastic and fascinating path into education. And I think as you kind of picked up, everyone has a different path and often it's those one or two things or people shouting for you and say, right, this is what I think you should do. I can see that potential in you. And even if those rocky times, that first placement um, could definitely relate to you in some of my placements had the same, but actually how that builds character and the lessons you learn from that are huge as well. And I think the key thing is finding that place or that school that's right for you. And I'm very lucky that I can work across quite a few schools in the academy. So I I see that. I go and see other schools and I find that privilege to work with them. So it's fascinating going through that. But let's step it back a little bit because you talked about the curriculum and you talked about that Ofsted focus on it and then what happens next. I kind of want to, just for this show, can you then define what task design means in the context of this show? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I've done a couple of sessions sort of throughout the years. It's been very reflective. This has been my sort of 
well, what is this role? What is task design? What does it look like? How can you articulate it for people? And at its heart, our deputy is very good at getting to the heart of something. And he basically just said, you know, the task in its purest form is what we give the kids to do to show they understand or show that they've learned what you want them to learn or how they interact with it. Um, I think of it like that, but slightly adapted. So for me, task design or the task is, you know, the end goal within that lesson. What is it you're giving them, but why are you giving them that? And we've had lots of conversations about tasks, not just being something you give at the end. It's sort of the episodes within the learning that allows the children to interact with the knowledge, sort of have an opportunity to try or apply some of the things that you want them to teach or sorry, what some of the things you want them to learn and then perhaps show over a longer period of time what it is that's stuck and why it has or hasn't stuck. Um, so, you know, the task is what you give them at various points throughout the lesson. And I think Elliot Morgan sort of summed it up because he was one of the first people that I started sort of researching and looking into it because, you know, task design wasn't something that was quite easy to find specific research or specific anecdotal stuff on um but he sort of puts it down to the instruction then the task and the assessment whereas i think all three um kind of have to coincide together yeah and it's a really nice segue into actually unpicking this element a bit more and i just want to reiterate the point you made that the last few years especially within the primary sector and I know we're both in primary and both got computing backgrounds. So there's a lot of similarity between us. There's been a massive contribution and thinking and ways of developing based on the Ofsted's requirement of curriculum. Mm -hmm. And what it's done is made us to go back to why. What are we teaching and why are we doing that? And we're building deliberate paths for children to go through in school. We're not looking at the Romans and, let's say, make an amphitheatre out of biscuits. We're not looking at the face of Muse and Moon and doing it out of Jaffa Cakes. What we're thinking is what are those key decorative and procedural knowledge that the children need to encourage that deep thinking? And especially with the work on racial science and the coaching cycle and getting lessons, um, getting teachers' quality up there, because we know quality teaching is a huge element, I think one of the bits that I feel that we've missed and we haven't talked about enough is this idea of what good tasks are in terms of that. And I know Ian Morgan, he talked about matching tasks with those instructional intentions. And I know previously, I talked about previously quite a lot about pre pre the curriculum focus from Austin in some ways. There was a lot of episodic memory activities, such as the Jaffa Cakes, such as different things. And in his blog, he talked about the idea of look, say, cover, write, check. So it's a common task used to promote spelling um, in schools. And it's done in a table format. And often there's a theme um, so such as air, fair, hair, chair. But the instructional intention of that is to remember those common graphemes, those mm -hmm. letters representing that sound. And, the, and then um, how they're represented in the phoneme, the sound as well from it. But actually what that task does is not that at all. It makes children look at the whole unit. So what are those poor proxies of, of um, learning or instances where you've seen that activities may be fun in school, but they may not really align to those learning intentions and your thoughts behind identifying those as well? I think it's hard um, because you end up, obviously, rightly or wrongly alienated in a large group of people and even today i still have conversations with colleagues um in various other schools and the same thing seems to crop up and i think there's this i don't know this sort of fear or concern that we're trying to turn children into just vessels of knowledge and i think i don't know for some reason it's become a bit of a dirty concept or a dirty word like that will want children to know lots of information. And um, obviously, for me, when I was, you know, telling family and stuff about this sort of role, and obviously how I got it, my uncle, who's a, he's an optometrist, so he's an eye doctor. Um, 
and he's retired, but you know, from everything he says, everything my aunt, his wife says, he's a very highly qualified man. You know, he flies all over the country um, and delivers lectures and advice and all sorts. So he's clearly an expert in his field. And he tells this sort of anecdote about knowing versus experiencing. And um, one of the things he said, obviously, I'm obviously not going to tell it very well, but there was, I think it was A-level physics. He said in his school, they were doing A-level physics and then some sort of, it, I think it was, it sounded like applied physics, but basically they were doing physics. Um, the physics he chose to do was very much knowledge first, then we'll do the experiments. The other group obviously did lots of just experiments and found out and then evaluated after. And he said, what was interesting is when we went to university, the people that did the other physics felt that they needed to do physics again. And that still sticks with me. And then me and my our head teacher were having a conversation recently. He'd recently been to Italy and we were sort of talking about that same thing because I'd had a conversation with a previous colleague and we're talking about that experience versus knowledge and what the balance is. And um, he'd said, you know, if he went on the tour of Pompeii, obviously there was lots of little things that through his own prior knowledge, he would be able to generate some sort of idea of mm. what he was seeing. But without the tour guide, it would have absolutely no meaning. And obviously there would be lots of misconceptions and corrections and that kind of thing. And I think that's where all those tasks, you know, those poor proxies come in. So, I mean, you have a wonderful experience there about the Romans and you do bits of things. But in terms of the concrete understanding of the Romans, in terms of their place and time, obviously the cause that they had, the effect that they had, um, you know, if you're thinking about broad historical concepts, but really why do children learn about the Romans? Obviously they need to know about the Romans to understand the medieval era. Obviously they need to learn about the Romans to understand of the fall of the Roman empire, why the Anglo-Saxons came and how Britain sort of developed over time. So obviously they're not just fun cultures that the horrible history videos mm. have lots of information about. Um, they're, obviously really important specific places and cultures. So for me that, you know, those poor proxies are the things you've already mentioned. Um, obviously the biscuit stone hinge or, you know, make it pyramids. And it all comes back to that. Why, you know, why are we doing it? And what are they going to come away with? And if you ask the children after, so what did you learn? And it, it always sticks to me when we did, um, algorithms and obviously making a jam sandwich or making a sandwich and programming um, or computer science you know what were you learning mm. quite a lot of the children will tell you they were learning how to make a sandwich when actually what they were learning was the process of correct instructions or sequencing instructions in a more logical way or coherent way so it's trying to be really explicit about the learning um, and you know people dislike it but I think it's really important to have that knowledge first, to the focus on the knowledge. Um, and I think that's where the whole task design comes from. Um, so for me, task design sort of forms lots of little bits within the lesson. You know, if I'm asking the children to have whiteboard time, it always sort of comes back to the sort of extended mind by Annie Murphy Paul, that idea yeah. of how many of us, you know, get out a piece of paper or sketch or doodle or, you know, need to, take what's in their brain out so that forms a key part of task design so whether that's a thinking model whether you call it a concept map and obviously there's lots of different models um but for me that's really important because that's how you start to generate you know those ideas and form meaning and what's really interesting is you can start to see connections between two children so what one child understands the other has a complete misconception and then that's sort of working it out because it's right in front of them both um so that's kind of one really key important element of it uh is the sort of extended mind taking it out and sort of constructing meaning from what's in your head because obviously that idea of um i'm going to quote it wrong but you know meaning is made in the mind of the learner i'll stand up at the front of the room or i'll demonstrate or show something it makes no sense until it reaches the learner and obviously based on their prior knowledge of their prior experience um it can be completely different to the person next to them and that's when you get there but 
But how did you get that from what I've just said? <laughs> Moment in the class. Yeah, and I think one of the points um, just picked up and wrote down is the idea of that prerequisite. And I alluded to it earlier a little bit. It's that journey you want those children to go through. You can take them to Pompeii, but if they don't know actually where this is in the world and the historical knowledge and some of that foundational knowledge, it doesn't matter what experiences or what knowledge. They need they need some of that base knowledge to just connect those dots. And I think that's a huge element of it. One of the poor proxies um, of learning, and we'll probably go into it a little bit later about why tasks fail, is that children, when you go into a classroom, often children may be quiet or be busy. Mm. And actually, is that good learning? I know that's quite a contagious way of articulating it in, and that's why it's very hard when you go in and make a quick snap judgment. That's why that shouldn't work. But if you are extended, if the children are having those rich conversations, I think that's the element that's really important. And so going back to your point earlier about talking to the children, it reminds me of the work I do a lot with the book study by Alex Bedford as well. And I know you've referenced it before in the past. And having those conversations with children, understanding where their thoughts are or where their gaps are in their knowledge when you're talking to them, actually helps you as a teacher really find, okay, this is what I need to do to correct it or to support them in that journey Yeah. Um, as well. And the conversations you have with children and provocative in questioning them and challenging them and often being those devil's advocates, like what would you do in just thinking algorithms um, and the jam sandwich element? What happens if you moved this sequence in a different order? What's the consequence of that? And that idea of critical thinking and doing that is that idea of getting into depth. And I think that's the biggest thing that task design in some way supports us is getting us into that depth. What do children know? What are the different types of activities we could do to create that high cognitive demand? So actually yeah. they are making the difference. I think it's interesting um, because obviously we, previous to this year, obviously I've you know been aware of Alex Bedford and the work of People Book Study, um, but it wasn't until joining the school that you use it that you realise actually this is very different. So in previous school, we did something very similar. You know, we sat down and talked to the kids with their books in front of them. Um, but it's completely not that. And that's just sort of cold questioning or providing elements of the learning and just seeing what comes. Like the, you know, the the, the trap everybody falls into is trying to help them or question them. Um, when really, you know, given enough time, given enough sort of empty space, you know, children tend to fill that gap and it's interesting what they come out with and having observed some recently, um, you know, with my class, just sitting back and watching just sort of the knowledge flow out and like key little things that you think, ah, I know exactly why they've said that, you know, I didn't explain it that way or I didn't make that connection or they're not linking back to that because of this. And it's just sort of that eye-opening thing and you can and when I start to unpick it, you know, there was a whole point um, at the beginning of the year when I was teaching uh, Anglo-Saxons and a lot of the tasks were sort of very disciplinary focused. So it was very much like thinking and behaving like a historian, which obviously is an appropriate thing to do. But there was clearly more of that without the focus on the sort of, um, <clears throat> the you know, the substantive knowledge of the topic. So obviously the children were able to say things like inferring that we're talking about artifacts, interpreting historical information, sources, but obviously didn't know why, um, they didn't know what the source was. So that sort of, that's the part when we sort of unpick it and when we talk about, you know, per proxies of learning, being in that lesson where the children were looking closely at artifacts and inferring details and asking questions, I think this is brilliant. They're both talking to each other. They're asking really insightful questions of each other about that brooch from the Anglo-Saxon period. But actually, do they know why they wore brooches? Do they know what they were made of, what the purpose was, why they were significant? All that kind of stuff sort of got lost because, you know, you sort of got caught up in the romanticism of the children being really invested in small objects which again is really important but there has to be a balance i think yeah i just wrote the word balance down before you said that because <laughs> i don't think there's no black and white is there um 
I'm going to ask you a quite clear question now, and um, I think it's going to be quite, it's not going to be an easy way of answering it, but what makes a good task? I mean, I think a task has to get the children thinking. Um, and a lot of the tasks that I sort of lean towards is it's very simple. And I think you go down the road of over complicating a task. Um, but really, it just has to be some element that gets them engaged or thinking deeply about the learning. Um, and it's hard to unpick any particular thing. But really, just, you know, for me, a simple thing is just, you know, a very simple model. So something like an inference square or, you know, a, a sort of diagram that can get the children to sort of unpick their learning a bit more. Um, one that we find is having lots of success is just a very simple flow diagram. Um, and the only reason is because it seems to scaffold, segment, and then at the end, pull everything together. So much to some of my colleagues, I'm a big fan of sort of A3 sheets that the children can work on together. Um, and obviously sometimes we'll do that in the iPads, but I like the idea of asking questions that build up to a bigger question. And obviously I'm not talking about sort of inquiry led learning. Obviously this is all within the knowledge. So say for example, when we're doing, um, ancient Egyptians, we had, a, we're sort of, we're looking at Tutankhamun and why he was significant and why we talk about him still today. But we were looking at sort of sources and really all we we're trying to do is build a picture of who he was and what we could learn about him. Um, and I'd sort of set it up in a flow diagram and the children had to just answer questions around it. And then the final question obviously was sort of a bigger one, but it allowed the children to pull all the knowledge or the pieces of knowledge back into that final one. Um, and what was brilliant about it and a couple of our you know my other colleagues that sort of had the same conversation was it just gives them the pieces and they can pick or choose some of the pieces so you know for some of your learners you might want to give them a hint for some of them you might not want to um you know you might want to have a sort of have a more heavier scaffolded task but you're still allowing them to interact with the learning and i think that's some of the things that we've sort of touched upon this year but I've gone a long way around. But for me, a, a, a good task allows the children to, you know, a retrieval task. You've stood at the front, you've shown them a video, you've talked to them about something. Right now, they just have to show that they've listened because obviously that doesn't always work with some of the children. And a good task should never just be at the end of the lesson because you've sort of spent a whole amount of time either talking, they're talking. I think a good task has parts or episodes to it so that you can, you know, have that back and forth. But again, it has to be very stripped back. It has to be explicit. Try not to put too much within it, if that makes sense. And I think that comes back from why. Why are you put in front of this children? Why are you giving that knowledge to the children? And why are you doing this task? And I think the more conversations and coaching conversations I'm having with teachers is, okay, what was the impact of that? What what did the children do? How do we know it had an impact? And going back again. And I think that learning and that alteration in the long term memory and you said making it it almost sounds really simple, making them think, but that is the key task. It's not a like let's keep you busy now. Uh, here's a highlight and all colouring in activity. Yeah, um, and I think but those, those do have their places though don't they as well yeah I mean I think that's the important thing that I sort of I looked at a task recently and it was very simply just labeling and obviously it's you'll have everybody will have seen it it's labeling the life cycle of an animal and you kind of think well what is the purpose of this task what do they need to know about the life cycle of an animal why do they need to know it and is them just labeling the sequence of that life cycle a good task? And that's a question I keep coming back. And I, I can't offer an alternative necessarily all the time, but you know, other times, some of the ta my most favorite tasks I've done this year have been geography tasks. 
And it's because we've started thinking about it more in a disciplinary way. So as a geographer, why do we need to know about the weather? As a geographer, why is it important to know about different mountain types? Um, and I think that's the key thing. So sometimes it's important to ask those questions in your field, or sometimes it's just really important to, you know, know that actually you can you need to interact with a map and looking at an atlas and finding key places is a skill and you know that's also an appropriate task and again sometimes so is coloring in and identifying certain aspects of something but it depends on what the task is is it the only task is it the thing that you're doing at the end of the lesson or is it forming parts of a bigger picture and obviously that comes with just you know confidence as a teacher how the curriculum set up and you know everything that goes along with it excellent it's a lovely uh, opportunity to hear the news and we'll be back with carl in a few minutes time it's time for a fresh start to language learning Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. A wide range of media outlets have covered the ongoing issue of reinforced autoclaved aerated concrete, or RAC, and its use in buildings, including schools, leading to concerns around safety. The BBC reports that buildings at 52 schools in England were at risk of sudden collapse due to dangerous concrete. While safety measures have since been put in place at these schools, because the situation was deemed critical, more than 100 others have also now been told to close areas with the concrete. These buildings were previously thought to be at less risk. The new guidance follows the collapse of a beam that it was thought to be safe. Head teachers are now making alternative plans just days before the start of the new academic year. Some pupils have been told they will be learning remotely, whilst others are being housed in temporary classrooms or even at other schools. The total number of confirmed schools affected in England is 156. The news has since triggered concerns in all three of the home nations. The Scottish Government said it was trying to establish how many schools contain RAC, whilst in Wales investigations continue, although there have been no reports at present. The Northern Ireland DV said schools were being checked as a matter of urgency. Ministers in England have been facing media and having struggled to keep up with a range of questions being asked, including how fixing the issues caused by RAC will be paid for. Opposition MPs have pointed out that schools themselves already have issues with funding and that local authorities have seen cuts in recent years, so finances may not be there at a local level. The DfE has also faced criticism for not publishing a list of schools affected, although it defended its actions, saying parents should hear direct from the school itself, at least at first. A school in South End, which caters for pupils with physical and learning difficulties, has contacted the BBC to outline the significant challenges it is facing, as the closure of its main building means staff and pupils cannot access essential special equipment. Whatever the outcome, it is certain that, for some pupils, this is the start of yet another unusual school year. Away from issues with buildings, Schools Week reports on plans to ensure all schools in England hold electronic registers, which the Education Secretary will have direct access to. However, proposals to introduce thresholds at which penalty notices must be considered for unauthorised absences are paused. They were part of the currently shelved New Schools Bill. New rules are not expected to come into force until 2024 but it has been made clear that ministers see attendance as an area which must improve. 
More than half of parents who responded to the consultation on the plans for e-registers disagreed due to the possible punitive use of the data collected. Officials said it would be used to enable better early intervention. 92% of local authority workers and 85% of school staff who responded support the plan. The DfE will move forward with changes to simplify recording of attendance or absence. In total, 22.3% of pupils miss more than one in 10 sessions in the 2022 to 2023 academic year. This is compared to 22.5% in the year 21 to 22, despite significant government intervention. Prior to the pandemic, these rates sat between 10 and 13%. The TES reports that a group of watchdogs, including Ofsted, are jointly to carry out targeted inspections in schools where there is a risk of pupils being exposed to serious violence or exploitation. The inspections will happen in six unnamed local authorities and examine how police, social services and health services tackle serious youth violence. The focus will be on multi-agency interventions and could include interventions in schools, parks, shopping centres or specific streets where young people may be at risk. The team will include representatives from Ofsted, the Care Quality Commission, HMI of Constabulary, HMI of Probation Services and each team will be led by an Ofsted Health and Social Care Inspector. Where a school is involved, they will be asked to show they have effective systems to identify children at risk of or subject to serious youth violence and children who are missing from school. The inspections will end in May next year. Full details of the report can be found on TES online. Finally, The Guardian reports that Lego is to begin selling bricks coded with Braille to help blind and partially sighted children learn to read the touch-based alphabet. The Danish makers of the bricks have made specialist versions tested and developed by blind organisations across the globe. The bricks have been sent to a selection of schools free of charge since 2020, but now they will be available more widely. Lego hopes the initiative will help parents, siblings and others share in learning Braille and to encourage play interactions between sighted children and visually impaired friends. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. Excellent. Now, I did not know about Lego putting Braille on their bricks. That sounds like a fascinating idea. Um, I really want to go and explore those. I know a few children in one of our schools that I'm working with have that. So welcome back, Carl. Uh, thank you for a lovely first half of the conversation. Um, we've got a few things I want to explore during uh, this next half an hour that we've got on the show. And you've already alluded to some of the activities um, that you have done, that you've enjoyed you found good and you alluded to the idea of these scaffolds um, and these diagrams again those conversations but i wondered if you could give uh, an example of a lesson or something that you've done with task design in particular you thought actually this was really effective or the opposite something that you didn't think was great and then when you did it again with another class or the following year how you adapted it as well so hopefully our listeners can get to the essence of the thought process is going behind it from someone who is doing this day in, day out, thinking about tasks in particular. Yeah, I mean, for me, my favorite tasks are the ones that sort of model the thinking or mirrors the thinking that goes on, or I imagine that would go on. I suppose that's a dangerous loaded concept. But um, I'd written a blog about it recently. Um, and one of the ideas we're learning uh, in RE um where we're looking at buddhism but we're looking at that sort of cycle within buddhism how you know what we do has consequences to our sort of state of mind and how that then affects us um within the cycle and you know me and the head teacher had sort of gone back and forth because he's the re lead and very passionate about re and obviously we're sort of having a conversation about the sequence of lessons and what this task would look like and then um, for me, I could just only really imagine it as a cycle with sort of parts shooting off it. Um, so I think it's probably called a cycle flow. And a lot of the sort of um, models that I would use for these sort of elements of the task would um, come from uh, organized ideas. 
which is a brilliant book for loads of those ideas. Uh, but the idea was basically just, you know, I give the children a, a selection of scenarios. So, you know, uh, stealing a suite or not tidying in the room or, you know, child level um, dilemmas, if you will, that they might face and sort of what their reaction would be, uh, what they might be thinking at the time, and then how that might affect their state of mind. So things like not tidy in the room, some of the children had said, you know, if you don't tidy your room, it's fine, your mum will pick it up after you. Um, how that will affect your state of mind, well, really, you're not really learning anything. You're not developing as a person because you just think well if I don't tidy my room mom's going to pick it up anyway so I don't need to tidy my room so what you learn is that you know being lazy is a good thing um but then some of the children have put other things like you know thinking about the effect it has on the mother or the parent or whatever it was um and then actually what it would do is it would alter their state of mind and they would decide or they then choose that they should tidy their room so then the cycle has developed another part and then the sort of I, I don't like the idea of extension but obviously it's for cover that everyone knows but the sort of extension part of the task was you know what if the sort of those what if questions or the why questions um, and obviously I can't think of off the top of my head but that's one of my favorite tasks and for me I always go to first of all what is it that they might be thinking or what is it that I want them to do so even if it's a historical lesson, now we were doing World War Two, and recently, you know, we just sort of jump into World War Two, and I sort of said that we've not really, and obviously because I just joined the school, I wasn't sure if they'd done anything on World War One, and actually in Year Five, I thought it's really important that they need to know about the Treaty of Versailles. You know, obviously the appeasement policy. There's quite a lot of things after World War One that directly affected World War Two, um. So we did a simple lesson on sort of looking at those things. And really it was just a discussion with the class. The kids were asking questions, obviously, you know, why, what would it feel like to just appease this horrible power brewing in Europe? Obviously everybody knew what was going on. We we're just kind of going, all right, but don't do it again, that kind of stuff. And then just getting the children to sort of map out the cause and effect, because that's what we were doing in the conversation. We were making links from events in the past and how they've affected where we were or where we wanted to be at the beginning of World War One. So kind of those very simple sequential or, you know, mapping out tasks. Um, and you can call them what you want, but that's always my fave to go to. And those types of activities and tasks in particular are very good for you to challenge children's thinking um, as well. And we were talking about the extended mind early and having um, – mapping those bits out are great i i know teachers love stationery um and this bit of side but i found you can get i, I use post-it notes all the time with children putting language in ordering them which do you think is most effective least effective and just having different ways like that and just scaffolding learning but one of the things i've just found is you can get these um that business card size um wipeable ones oh, and often brilliant they're great. I, I often could go around the classroom and just write a question on it or put something else on there just to like, like sh now show me, now tell me, now, or give me a non-example I put on there or something else that actually challenges their thinking. And it's that sequencing of what those tasks are trying to do, how you get children to challenge themselves. But those kind of things are just not, we're saying the simple, they're not, because actually we're thinking very deliberately about this. But the other side of it is a lot of schools now don't have to write a sequence for quick curriculum because they've got that there. So let's actually think about how do we deliver this? How do we do those elements of a lesson or the assessment and making sure we have those conversations with the children that we know what they're doing? Um, and it's, it's more that deliberate practice and that deeper level of thinking with all of these different almost talk elements of our toolkit aren't they as the teachers but I developing it's, them it's interesting because um i sort of explained we had a um a school improvement visit and explaining task design and what it was and obviously she'd made it very clear that you know this is going to be something that we'll need explaining should we be inspected um but she was sort of saying the same thing and obviously i'd done some training with her in a few years ago in a previous school 
where it was all about developing a teacher's toolkit and it's you know it's little things that um you have almost in your tool belt or your batman utility belt that you can whip out that you know they're very low on resources but really it's that sort of low floor high ceiling thing and um, mm. you know the task doesn't look at its heart um to be terribly complicated but you know you can push it as far as you want to or bring it as you know back as close to you as you need to um and that sort of brings me on to the obviously the pitfalls i suppose um with some of them and i think that's one of them is um just sort of overcomplicating tasks and i've been there myself what what are some then the other pitfalls because i'm just thinking if you think of it from a ect perspective overwhelmed in a classroom they've got to manage a class there's a lot cognitively they've got to go on as well what are the some of the other pitfalls that you can um fall in or poor proxies for learning then i think the thing is obviously as a teacher you need to know what you're teaching so that's obviously the first um and a lot of the time because we're time poor you know we go to big websites and download powerpoints and whatever but we're not really having ownership of it and i think because a lot of the curriculum work that had been done before me so i mean in the school i'm joining you know the curriculum is broken down into a sequence of lessons um and some people you know like or dislike it but i know what each lesson's core knowledge is it's not you know a statement on a history curriculum that says the children need to know the significance of the romans in britain you know there's a lot more in there um so i think that's the thing is being really laser focused on you know what it is that lessons handing over and trying not i mean i do this all the time i sort of go off on tangents and it's trying not to go off on too many tangents but you know there's the key things for me is thinking about everybody so making sure there's not too much reading not too much listening um and not too much time you know trying to break it up you don't want it to be like a you know grand prix where everything's like boom 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 but you want there to be time for the children to talk time for you to talk and i'm not one of these people that thinks that teachers just sit back and be silent you know if we need to talk for 10 minutes you need to talk for 10 minutes it's, there's sometimes there's no other way to do it um but also the thing with the sort of models or the toolkit i think is really important and it's something throughout this year that i've seen develop so as i said i've joined this school as they're sort of at a, a stage in the curriculum journey um, and they've done a lot of work previously, obviously worked with Alex Bedford, people book study. And one of the things they were doing is building up sort of a, a bank, a toolkit of editable templates or resources that all staff could use um, and pick up and make tasks. And sort of what I've done this year is, along with the assistant head, is offer a template. We've tried it out for a half term and said, you know, it's going to be sticky. It's not going to work all the time, but just see how it works. And what was brilliant was when we came back together and go, well, how did you use it? And everybody just sort of said, well, we did this. And like the amount of things and opportunities for this very simple thing. So it borrowed the idea of using three heads and given three specific scenarios. And it's very much like a concept cartoon in science. You know, have got three ideas and somebody's either more wrong or less right type of thing. Which one is it? And explain why. But just amazing stuff. So we've got a high arc deaf resource base as part of our school and they'd use the three heads as part of their um the pud which they call it which is sort of their deaf awareness um with the children and like it was just presenting three scenarios or three options but again that's a brilliant task for what is you know a social and emotional well-being lesson you know it's really thinking about the dilemmas within it so I think if, you know, an easy quick win would be to start thinking about, you know, very easy editable banks of resources um, or models that can be tweaked or adapted among staff. Excellent. I'm just going to throw it on its head a little bit. because we've been thinking a lot about the depth of tasks um, and the purpose of them. Is there a place for tasks that are there just to motivate children? 
to get that into like here's a task I'm just going to do it not much of a learning intention from it maybe slightly essential but actually more of it is episodic like let's get you into the topic and understand it yeah i mean i think we've had similar conversations this year sort of like you know what is motivation and is it important and you know anecdotally people are talking about children being slightly more apathetic since covid and you can you know diagnose whatever it is to your heart's content but that's a lot of the same conversations are cropping up and i think you know it is important to do tasks that are exciting or stimulating or you know motivate the class or children or get them engaged in something and everybody likes to do the big bang um and like i'm not a jazz hands all singing all dancing teacher i'm quite content with that now (laughs) but i think what i have to come back to is again there's a danger there i think of course it has its place the same with everything in education there's always a place for something and someone and it's nobody's job to tell you otherwise um but you know why do we have to link geography to something else why does history have to be taught through an art lesson or a you know an it lesson these things are exciting and stimulating and motivating in their own right it just that's your job as a teacher i suppose is uh, to decide is it going to be one of those big motivating lessons does it need to be is there another way you can do it and like some of the times i've thought oh this is going to be a drag um and then the children totally surprised me you know there's a boy in my previous class who isn't one of the children to come out with these sort of things and said you know re i love it when his parents come in for uh, parents even said i just really want to see his re book he just comes home and talks about it all the time and, you know, some of the children would say it's boring, but he loved the sort of moral dilemma, the conversations and how we're using religious texts to unpick questions we're asking of society now. And I think there's a big element, um, and you said motivated because of the task, and I've heard it in terms of sports analogies and in terms of exercise. So your motivation comes from when you start doing it. You've got it break that barrier you've got to do it and the motivation innately comes because you're getting the children to think you're getting all the children working hard thinking deeply thinking hard about things being involved in all the tasks and examples she shared tonight have opportunity to scaffold that learning have an opportunity for everyone to have a voice and there straight away if you've got that engagement therefore they're going to be intrinsically motivated from it And often children, same as you, Carl, I do go off on a tangent, but I know I had a parent once who came in and said, actually, that's one thing, that's one of the one things that the the children really liked about it. We went, talked about instances or different things in different contexts. So they knew about my children, but because I was aligning what we were learning with my children or another experience of me. So it was just trying to create that rounded picture. Now, I know we haven't got, long um and i think the next question we could talk about a lot so let's see how concise because i think actually this may be another podcast um episode and it comes because both of us um very much with the computing side and with the use of technology and so forth where does the role of technology play in task design then because i think you could go fully one way with technology um, and replace what you do online uh, on paper and be exactly the same, or you could go slightly differently. But what's your viewpoint on that? I mean, it just, it has the potential to do everything. I think, you know, there's lots of different tools out there and obviously I'll not name names, but that have sort of become online learning or we were using them all for home learning. But, now you can basically build a package of a lesson that you take the children on a journey of um you know obviously you could create a lesson presentation that includes content that you've produced drawn videos that you want them to watch you can you know have all if you know if you have one to one device you can have all the children on their devices following along live with you so you can theoretically maintain all of their attention all of the time 
and obviously attention is what we create you know that's our currency in education um and obviously i'd recently seen a thing just slightly go off on a tangent which sort of quantifies basically the gap in attention you know when lots of things happen whereas devices can sometimes hold that attention they can make it more tangible and more flexible so you know we're talking about post-it notes and stuff and you can get things like digital whiteboards that you have post-it notes on them that you can write things and move them and sort them but also you could do it with somebody who's not in the room or you could do it with somebody who's you know across the room and you could work in partnership so you can sort of move things about it can make the whole thing flexible you can do quick quizzes you know it just kind of the the world is your oyster with technology and task design um and i think that's some of the key things i'm quite i've taken quite a step back i suppose with using a lot of the technology purely just because of the setup of some of the children in the class um in terms of attention it's too difficult to hold a lesson um because of the devices and the book almost provides that sort of regulation and structure. Um, and we've sort of phased it back in, whereas, you know, there's other children who need that technology because it removes a barrier, you know, things like being able to read, you know, obviously if they're not working at key stage level and some of the tasks, and even a simple, and I try not to put as much writing as possible on any of my tasks for that reason. Um, but, you know, I can put a QR code that reads it out to them or, you know, they could use things like immersive reader. They can read it out. They can tap things. They can show them pictures. I mean, it literally removes tons and tons of barriers as well as allowing them to move freely. So, you know, we could talk for days mm. <laughs> about and possibilities. I think, yeah, I, I agree. And I think that's what we should do. But I think one of the caveats with it um, is that technology can support, but it also can hinder. And without really thinking carefully about what you're doing and why and the task you're creating, it can't be just there as a consumption device and, right, let's get rid of the exercise books and do it on there. Actually, the real deliberate thinking about these tasks um, has to be thought of as well. Yeah. And whether it's through the application element of it, I'm doing some, I'm doing um, exercises and mapping it out and then doing that, great, or vice versa as well. And I think think we've got to really really carefully develop it use it and i think it has a real power but i also think caveat is actually let's look think about the pedagogical side of it as well so before we finish really really quickly because we're on a tight deadline tonight um, unfortunately but i know we will carry this on carl another point what's that one piece of advice then that you would give a teacher if they want to think about task design? It's going to be very cliche, but asking why. So why are you giving them that task? Why are you downloading that task from that website? The why and what. So why are you giving them it and what do you envisage them doing with it? Or what do you see them doing at the end? And just spend a little bit more time thinking about the task as opposed to the instruction, because I mean, once we've been teaching, you know, that first year, once you get that out of the way, you kind of get into a rhythm, you know how you're going to disseminate information, whether it's a video or how you're going to say it. But actually, if you focus more on the what they're going to do in the task, you have far more wins, I think. Thank you. And thank you for listening to Teachers Talk Radio. I hope you enjoyed this introduction on task design with our guest, Carl McGarth. To listen back on Teach Talk, Teachers Talk Radio shows, please download the Podbeam app or visit your favourite podcast player and search Teachers Talk Radio. You can also visit ttradio.org forward slash listen back. Follow us on Twitter at TT Radio Official and tweet us using the hashtag. Okay, so now next at nine o'clock tonight via the Podbeam is Sean McKay. It is his debut show. And one that I think is going to be really interesting because it's talking about developing that reading culture in school. So thank you again, once again, Carl. Thank you very much for having me. Brilliant. Uh, no, follow Carl on uh, Twitter. It's Mr. M uh, ICT. And I know he's got lots of really great examples and we will pick this conversation up for another time. So thank you for listening. Until next time. Goodbye. It's time for a fresh start to language learning.
Pearson Edexcel's new student-centered French, German, and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability, or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.